Thank you very, very much uh, for the invitation and the nice introduction. Um, I don't think I'll live up to it, but uh, I really appreciate the opportunity to come here. I love coming back here. It's always good to see old friends and new faces at UTMB. Uh, UTMB, as, as you all know, if you work here or you benefit from UTMB, UTMB has a big impact nationally uh, on aging research as well as, as clinical practice. So. It's great to be back, uh, see a lot of faces and, and names and so forth. And as I sort of got pulled around to, to meet with various people, it was fun to see the growth of the campus, too. It's changed a lot just in the last few years. And uh, anyway, fun to see. Even though it was foggy, it was still OK. <laughs> so uh, I want to talk to you about uh, sort of a take you through a, a story of uh, hopefully by the end of this story you will understand why the title is what it is. Exercise as a form of medicine, those of us who have been in the field a long time have always felt that exercise was an effective form of treatment or medicine. Um, and there was actually a formal sort of declaration of that by the American Medical, Associ American Medical Association and the American College of Sports Medicine back in 2007 starting an initiative called Exercise as Medicine. I added another word to that, and I do it for a very specific reason. I'll get to that, and that is regenerative medicine. We'll talk about that as we go. But I'm going to talk about uh, focus on our aging studies today. We do have studies in other uh, conditions and diseases, which uh, uh, I could make a strong case for this term being in those as well. But let's just jump right in. So as we're supposed to do now, everywhere we go to speak, we, we have to disclose all of the ways that we make all kinds of extra money, right? <laughs> and uh, this is my complete slide. <laughs> there is no money in exercise. But I do have a center at UAB, and just to highlight a little bit, we, we developed this uh, center formally in 2011, and it's about 210 people across the UAB campus. And this phrase really means something to us. Uh, this is really what we do. We move people, we do research on those people, and the end game is to optimize how we're taking care of people to sort of move across the spectrum from research to medicine. All right, we do have, uh, as, as uh, Dr. Volpe indicated, grant support from a variety of sources, and I just recognize that now. Most of what I'm going to talk to you about is research funded by uh, the National Institute on Aging, as well as the National Center for Medical Rehabilitation Research. I won't talk much about some of this other work. A little bit of it is actually related to the VA work as well today. Um, I'm notorious for running out of time, so I move this slide to the beginning. These are really important people. These are people who have helped in a number of capacities throughout these studies that I'll, I'll touch on today. Some of them are former trainees who have moved on. Some of them are active collaborators and folks involved with us today. I'll spend a lot of time talking about work done by Neil Kelly and Mike Steck, who have now moved on. Um, also, some work by Anna Thalaker Mercer, who was a postdoc with me years ago and is now at Cornell University. Uh, Dave Mayhew, as well, who's moved on. He's now in Boston. Uh, these people played a key, key role in, in, in the studies that I'll sort of step you through. So um, what you see in the backdrop of this slide is a skeletal muscle sample from a person who has been the sample itself has been treated in a lab where we can identify the different types of cells that are in it. And I put it up here on this slide just to sort of introduce this concept because you're going to see some stains that look like this as we go. But skeletal muscle in human beings is made up of three primary types of muscle fibers, and they're color-coded here, copper, green, and these sort of dark fibers. And, and it's important to recognize that having all three of them means that a muscle can perform functions across a wide range. Um, the more and more we work a muscle to train it and become better at recruiting the fibers that are in it to actually do the work, we actually start to transition away from these guys because they fatigue really easily. So these dark fibers are not that useful to us in a trained muscle. We tend to get fewer of these and they transition to these green ones. 
And then the ones that are in copper are what we call type 1 fibers. They're the ones you're using right now. You're not doing anything that costs a lot of muscle effort. You're just sort of holding your neck up if you're not asleep. And, and that's a type 1 muscle fiber activity that's happening. So I'm going to step you through regenerative medicine, what I call neuromuscular aging, and sort of a term that is not a formal term, but I'll explain it when I get there. And what we do in terms of exercise as a form of regenerative medicine, I'll talk about that. And this is really weightlifting or resistance training. Uh, we'll talk about some factors that influence how well people respond to that type of treatment. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about how we have learned from these previous studies to actually try to improve upon our exercise dose for the older adult, the prescription itself that we think might be ideal, and then we'll just talk about uh, what, we're ha what we're doing now. All right, so what is regenerative medicine and why do I use it? A field of cutting-edge medicine described as creating new tissues that provide, repair, replace, restore structures and functions that are lost, damaged, aging, diseased, defective, et cetera, et cetera. So I would argue that when we do what we do to alter the structure and function of cells and tissues to make them function better, and I'll show you some of that, we actually activate many regenerative pathways that are available to us. They just need to be turned on. So one of sort of the, the, the central theme of everything that I do scientifically, and I'll share with you, is that our organ systems are demand-based systems. UTMB got famous for doing a lot of bed rest studies with NASA. What is that? That's a very low demand environment. You lay in bed, things deteriorate. They deteriorate because they're, you're not putting a demand on them. Muscles get smaller, bones get weaker, the list goes on. When you place a demand on a system, it adapts. If the demand is too high and too frequent, we maladapt, right? So we might develop hypertension because we have this chronic stress that uh, is, we're exposed to with every beat of the heart. Well, that amount of stress is actually very useful for adaptation if it's infrequent in response to exercise and then the heart rests, relatively speaking, rests for many, many, many hours in between. So this is a key, key concept that I want to sort of hammer home here. I'm not going to give you a quiz at the end, so don't worry. This is just to demonstrate, this is a review that came out a few years ago, and actually it addresses the point, exercise is the real poly pill. There really is no pill for it. But when we exercise, you can activate stem cell populations that are just sort of laying in wait. They're dormant. They're uh, quiescent. They're sort of just cells in various tissue beds that are waiting to be activated. Some of those are in muscle. Some of those that we're now learning about are actually in the heart itself. Uh, <clears throat> some of those are activated, uh, delivered via the bloodstream and actually performing functions that are useful in the brain and so forth. So again, think about demand. Let's put a demand on the system and it will adapt. This is just some of the various molecular signals that we have identified and as Dr. Volpe indicated, we're learning a lot more. We will soon hopefully be learning a lot more with this big study. This is a very simple snapshot of some of the things that exercise is known to do. I'll run through them quickly. This is just to give you this concept that we, it is a regenerative stimulus. So we can activate stem cells. I've already mentioned that. This means we can activate what we have. That's what endogenous means. It doesn't mean that we actually have to implant them from some other source. We can turn on the regulation of our, of our genome, how we express genes. We can activate various processes in cells. We can induce changes in the central nervous system as well as the peripheral nervous system. We can influence muscle. That means that's what myo is. Angiogenesis means we can make new blood vessels. We do that actually very effectively with exercise. Uh, strengthen bones. Improve our sort of energy production factories that are in every cell. These are called mitochondria. We can make more of those. We can burn up some fat. Uh, and really exciting new work in the last five years, we're actually starting to understand the impact of exercise on cancer tumor biology. So uh, 
this type of work goes well beyond the concept that exercise makes you feel better. We've all known that, right? We've known that for uh, many, many decades. In fact, you can trace that back hundreds of years. Exercise makes you feel better. Now we're trying to understand it. And this new cancer work is actually quite exciting. So I won't bore you. i just like to highlight very briefly some of the recent papers that make this point. Neurogenesis means we're doing something to activate stem cells in the brain that are actually having an impact. Uh, improving our ability to retain stem cells in the heart after some type of uh, event. In this case, uh, you can induce a heart attack in an animal model and, and do that. Growing new arteries, uh, actually influencing blood flow delivery to a tumor in a way that reduces the need uh, or reduces the dose requirement for the chemotherapy. So now for any given amount of chemotherapy, you get a bigger bang for your, your dose under an exercise stimulus because it can deliver to the tumor better. And in this last one, you know, we all, when you think about cancer, one of the things you think about that, that sort of scares all of us is this idea that it can go to other body parts, right? It can metastasize and go other places. And one place we never want it to go is to the brain. Well, this is a very nice, fairly recent animal study demonstrating that the blood-brain barrier which is our way of sort of protecting the brain, is strengthened by exercise, so a metastatic tumor has less of a chance to be delivered to the brain. So very cool. Um, this is actually more intended for, for uh, trainees, perhaps, in the room or people thinking about exercise-related research grants. I'm not going to step you through this in detail, but this is just to show you that if we want to prescribe exercise to somebody and we want to know if it works, down here in this box are some of the things we might look for to see if it works. There's all kinds of things that influence whether or not it works or how well it works. And so that's what our research is all about. And, and the, the work that we're doing here with uh, the folks at UTMB on that national study is to understand how all these inputs influence the outcome, including things that modulate how well we activate our genes and so forth. All right, so let's talk about aging uh, and sort of step through our, our path here. We've studied, uh, the list is, is well beyond this now, but I'm going to summarize what we have in a current manuscript uh, that we're trying to get published. Uh, just on a, about 220 people, you can't really do longitudinal aging uh, the way we might like because scientists don't live to be 150, right? But what we can do is we can compare people who are recruited under similar conditions, similar health histories, et cetera, and try to understand the impact of aging cross-sexually by comparing these, this age group to this one, to this one, to this one. So I'm going to just show you a few slides on that real quick. So one thing we know is that we lose muscle mass if we're not trying to prevent it. And what you see here, uh, these are the results from DEXA scans. So what you see, thigh muscle mass or thigh lean mass is a really important outcome for us because that's a key muscle group that makes us mobile, makes us stable when we're upright, makes us get up and down out of chairs, uh, in and out of bed, up and down stairs, and so forth. And what you see, and this is the first slide, is in men, we lose about two and a half kilograms over this age span of thigh muscle mass. That's a lot. So that's, that's over five pounds. In fact, that's close to six pounds of muscle. That's a lot. And particularly when you look at the amount we start with. So this is a pretty dramatic hit. What you see in green is a similar trend, although not quite as severe, in the arms. All right, when we go to women, it's the same story. Starting material is not quite as much. Obviously, there's a sex difference there. But the magnitude of loss is almost two kilos, and it's pretty substantial. Again, arm lean mass goes down as well. So we want to try to prevent that, or at least try to counteract that as much as possible. When we look at how well we can contract muscle, whether it's by strength or the development of power, we think power is a really important measure as a fall preventative. And also, just for day-to-day -day mobility and fatigability, we want to be able to do things fairly easily. And the more explosively or the more powerfully we can contract muscle, the easier things become. So power declines dramatically. This is men. Look at this number. This is, these are watts. This is knee extension power. But this is where we are at, at a young age. 
We're less than half of that number, uh, you know, nearly five decades later. So this is something that we want to intervene on. Strength kind of follows that too. Same thing in females, you'll see the same kind of trend. Just this tail. Now the difference actually between the two is interesting, and that is women sort of retain both power and strength fairly well into this decade, and then it starts to tail off, whereas if you saw in the men, it's already starting to taper, even at this age group. What's the average age of the retirement from pro, pro athletic, pro sports, mid thirties, power's gone, <coughs> game over. <laughs> All right. We also do a measurement that's useful to us diagnostically, and that is we, we use electrodes to measure activation of muscle on the leg when, when a person does something as simple as sitting and standing. And if we do that and we relate it to a maximal activation of that muscle, we can actually determine how hard is this? How difficult is this? How much muscle is being recruited to just stand from a chair? And these demonstrate that in uh, men at age 72, they're recruiting about 62, 63% of their available muscle to stand up. And in women, it's closer to 70, it's 69. So that's a pretty big number. If you've ever done weight training, and I f if I handed you a weight that was 69% of your maximum, you could do it about 10 times before you couldn't do it anymore. So this indicates that these folks could do this about 10 times, couldn't do it anymore. We don't want that. We want them to be over here where they could do it all day. All right. When we get, and I'll probably skip through some of this just for the sake of time, but when we get into the, the, the tissue itself, as I said on that opening cartoon or that opening picture with the muscle fiber image, we have three types of fibers in our muscle. These are the ones we're using in the room now. They don't fatigue very much. They're called type 1. As we work harder, we start to recruit what are called 2A and eventually the 2X, those black ones I showed you. And what this really shows you is that men and women do not age the same. And what it really shows you is that the men are in gray, the females are in white, they do suffer some atrophy in this type 2 fiber type, but they suffer a pretty severe atrophy in this type 2 fiber type. The men have a little bit here, nothing going on there. And so they're much different. Now, if I went back a few slides, you would say, well, what's going on? Because the amount of whole muscle is the same decline in both men and women. So there's a difference in how we do it. Women seem to do it by the fibers themselves getting smaller, and we think the men are doing it by actually losing the number of fibers, differentially than, than, than what you see in the... Uh, I'm going to skip that. That one's going to take too long to explain. One of the other characteristics that we see, which is a sign that part of what is happening in an aging muscle has to do with the nervous system. And the nervous system, uh, as we sort of lose our connections with muscle fibers, they tend to uh, be renervated and saved but in doing that, we get these groups. So this is a young, healthy muscle where the three colors are really kind of spread around in a mosaic. As we get older, they start to cluster together. You get what's called fiber type grouping. And in a severely grouped muscle, you get this kind of a pattern. And that really tells us that that muscle probably is going to functionally be impaired. When we look at the sex differences, and now you've got the line in men and the bars in, in women, this is another indication that there's a major difference. So you would look at this, you say, wow, these women are really in trouble because they have a lot of this fiber type grouping. I could turn that around and tell you, maybe they're just more successful at this process of re to save fibers from dying away. Uh, but the bottom line is there's a big age difference or a big sex difference in how that's handled. So let's get to the good stuff. Now let's talk about what we do about it. So we're going to talk about resistance training, and the concept is really straightforward. We have a muscle in a young, healthy person that looks like this. As we age, we lose some of these fibers, and what I would tell you is that I think we probably lose them more readily in men. Uh, but, and then the remaining ones get smaller, so these are smaller than those. So we end up with this... Uh, we're stuck with fewer fibers and they're small. And we want to restore the muscle function. And to do that, we've got to make the fibers bigger. We don't have a, a means of actually increasing the number again. So we're stuck with what we have. 
When we do something to stimulate the muscle, we just want to make the fibers bigger. So how do we do that? So four, four months, in this case, in this study, four months of pretty intensive strength training. What I'll point you to is that these are, this red line is the mean of young people, and this sort of area is what's called a 95% confidence interval. That just means if you're in that region, it's really no different than, than, than the group that hits the red line. So what this shows you is that if we measure muscle mass of the thigh in four months' time, and here you see we're, we're uh, 40 years apart almost, in four months' time we've almost restored the amount of muscle in the thigh. And if we look at the fibers, we actually do restore it. So we've erased, at least at the level of these fibers, we've erased, erased 40 years of age. Now, we haven't replaced any fibers that were lost in number, but we've, re we've restored the size of the remaining ones. When we, when we look at this grouping concept, uh, the, 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 this idea of denervation and renervation of fibers, one of the things we notice is that the people who have more severe grouping, after a period of resistance training, it actually starts to reverse and get better. So H just means high grouping, moderate and low grouping. So those people who have a lot of it, it seems to get, uh, there seems to be an improvement, actually. What about the function? Again, strength and power are kind of the two that we, we, we study a lot. On the left is strength. We've almost fully restored that just in the first eight weeks. And power we have fully restored in the first eight weeks. So this type of training can work. So uh, just as a quick summary, three days a week of high-intensity training, resistance training, just about restores uh, the size of the cells, of the fibers, and the function of the muscle itself. It doesn't mean that everybody responds equally, though, and that kind of jumps into this concept. Inter-individual response heterogeneity, this is something we're really interested in. So if we took everybody in this room and did that program, we would have some people who ex responded extremely well, some who did okay and some who were sort of resistant to it. You know, they got benefit from it, but not the, as much benefit as someone else. And we want to understand that. So uh, really quickly, uh, let me just say, we've trained a lot of people, and this is one outcome, not all outcomes, but just one outcome. How big did the fibers get, the muscle fibers? And we have a group of people who didn't get a whole lot of benefit. In fact, some didn't get much of anything. We have a group that responded pretty well, and then we have a group that really, really adapts well. So to understand why that is, we kind of go back to our map and start to tease apart what are some of those reasons. So some of the things that you might think of are things like, well, maybe they didn't come to the gym as often. Not true. So adher we, we're really strict about adherence. So we want people to attend the sessions, they're supervised, they do the work. And there's no differences in adherence. Well, what about their diet? Maybe that's, that's a big difference. We found no differences in their dietary intake, protein intake, and so forth. When we start getting into the muscle tissue, though, it kind of gets exciting. Their ability to turn on stem cells is different. Their ability to activate growth factors is different. Their ability to turn on what's just another term for this is the protein synthesis pathways in a muscle is different between people. And... We also notice that before they even start, their gene expression is different, which might predict how well they're going to respond. There are differing levels of inflammation in the muscle. And then this last one is also related, again, to protein synthesis. Uh, and, it, and we find that that's different. So to summarize all of that without getting into the, the details, the people who don't respond quite as well or, or in this, for this specific measure, we call them low or non-responders, they don't add any stem cells as the fibers are trying to grow, and they just really don't turn the machine on as well. But you get these people who kind of do what we expect. They add a few stem cells along the way, and they grow. And then these people, for some reason, they just sort of, these are those people that we all envy, right? These are the ones that you look at them and you say, you just have to look at the weights right? And things just magically happen. We all know who we're talking about. Those special athletes that just for whatever reason carry a lot of muscle mass uh, and so forth. And these people, we, what we found is they actually have more stem cells to start with. They're, the way they express their genes is much different to start with. They're just different. 
All right. Uh, skip that. That was actually a summary of kind of the differences in the gene pool. What I want to talk about just briefly is, is a little bit of this concept. And this ribosome biogenesis is, is really a marker for us of what, what is the capacity for these muscle cells to make new protein and get bigger. Just think of it that way. And what we basically did in this study was we took another group of older adults, all older adults, trained them, very short term, just four weeks. Again, we identified a group that did fairly well, a group that did really well, and a group that didn't benefit as uh, much at all. And in doing that, we're able to kind of start to tease apart how important is this, uh, is this activation of this protein synthesis machine. Ignore all this because uh, this is actually uh, – some details I won't jump into, but let me just say, if we're making more of these products, this is uh, RNA, which leads to new protein. This is RNA, which actually makes for more ribosomes. If we're making more of that, that means the muscle has a greater capacity to get bigger. And those people who we call extreme responders, they make more of both of those things, which is good. They also recruit those stem cells and add more of those to the fibers as they grow. So again, uh, an indication that they're primed and ready to go. Sometimes it's not good enough just to make those observations though. We kind of like to dig a little deeper and I'll summarize this slide by telling you we can take stem cells out of that small piece of muscle that you know we've, some of us have, have donated to science and we can isolate stem cells from it. Then we can study those cells. And what this is showing you is that if, when we study those cells, we can stimulate them to get bigger in a dish, and we can use some growth factors and things to make them bigger, which is what we did going from these green tubular cells to these big ones. And then if we block that step that I just talked about, this ribosome, biogenesis, we completely block the growth. So we think it's a really, really important step in this whole process. All right, so then basically those first studies told us that three days a week high resistance training works pretty well for about two-thirds of the older adults, and about one-third needs something different from that. So we did a, what we call dose optimization. This is a clinical trial where we actually looked at four different doses, and you might envision it like this. At least UAB Media envisioned it like this. I didn't. <laughs> so this came out in the UAB magazine when we started the study. What's the optimal prescription, right? I would have put much different things on the bottle, but the point is you get the idea. You can think about it from a conceptual standpoint, though. There's not a physician in this room who would dispense a medication to a patient and say, here you go, take some of these, right? The bottle has a prescription on it. It's with or without meals, it's this many times a day, it's this many milligrams, on and on and on. So exercise is the same thing. You can't just, somebody you know, walks into your clinic and on their way out the door you say, you should do more exercise, good for your blood pressure, you know, you, you, you're at risk for diabetes, et cetera, et cetera. You should do some exercise. If they don't have a prescription that makes sense that's going to lead them to the benefits, then we're in trouble. So what we've done here is actually try to define what that should be. So this was just published fairly recently, but it was we compared four doses, and this is a really multidisciplinary team. We've got geriatricians, we've got a physical therapist, we've got muscle biologists, we've got a variety of folks, a surgeon on here, we've got the muscle, a cardiologist a team of people that really wanted to ask and answer the question, what's the best way of doing this? If we were going to actually write an exercise prescription on a prescription pad and hand it to a 72-year-old, what should it say? Certainly not going to say do more exercise. What should it say? So what we did, again, we th I think anyway, at kind of the level of the muscle cell. I want to know how can I optimize this program to get the most out of it. So we designed three programs. The first one was what we had done before. Monday, Wednesday, Friday, pretty high intensity stuff. I didn't show you all the results, but we basically thought that in some of these people who didn't do quite as well, we think we just kind of led them down this road of chronic inflammation in the muscle for four months. 
Okay? So this next one is also three days a week. So the three letters are Monday, Wednesday, Friday. High, high, high. This is high, low, high. So what we did is high on Monday, low intensity on Wednesday, and high again on Friday. We thought, well, that's going to give them a break. They're going to actually be able to, we think it's going to be beneficial from a functional standpoint to still bring them in and exercise them, but the dose was much lower. Then we decided to just drop Wednesdays. So we had one group that was randomized to just come Monday, Friday. Wednesdays, you stay home. Of course, everybody wants to be randomized to the two-day-a-week group, <laughs> right? And then the fourth one, which was kind of our control group, so to speak, not really a control, but we fully expected if you only did high intensity once a week on Monday and low intensity on Friday, we, we fully expected that to not be effective, okay? So what we expected to happen was if we were just looking at how much muscle regrowth they got, I like to call it regrowth because we're starting with less and we want to normalize it. We're not trying to make bodybuilders. What we're trying to do is normalize muscle function and size. And so we thought that these two would be the best because there's good intensity on Mondays and Fridays in both of them. I thought the throwing in the middle day, which we actually used to develop muscle power, so the resistances were low, but they were doing movements very fast. It was explosive stuff. Okay, and the whole idea was to develop power while we were also giving the muscle somewhat of a break from the heavy stuff. All right, so what happened? Well, number one, this is again for the students and trainees probably. I always look at this slide and I say, so you want to do clinical trials. <laughs> so what did we do? Well, we reached out, or we had 624 people contact us about the study. We completed 63 people. Won't step you through all of this, but we, there's a lot of people that screen out, right? Two-thirds of them screen out. Then we get down to those who kind of meet the criteria. A third, or almost half of them don't want to do it. Eventually, we get to the point where we get 74 people randomized to these four treatments. So the elite of the elite, right? And then they stick with us. And this, by the way, is long-term. This was 35 weeks. So that's, we're asking a lot. So they're in the study a long time, and we end up with a complete data set down there at the bottom. So what happened? Well, we were sort of partially right. The people who got high, low, high training gained the most muscle mass. The people who got the three days a week, which we thought was more of a sort of chronic inflammation state, they still did okay. On, remember, these are the averages. I'll get to the details in a sec. And the people who did Monday, Friday high also did well. And then this group did not significantly gain anything, which is kind of what we expected. When we just look at the thigh, which again is for us a critical outcome, the same trends kind of apply, although this group got more than we expected in the thigh. But this group just sort of came, you know, in terms of muscle recovery or muscle restoration, this group definitely rose to the top. They gained more muscle. So we were kind of encouraged by that. This is actually maybe a better way to look at it. I know it's a little bit complicated. But if you actually look at the individual people, probably the most important take home for me, I mean, yes, it's important that on average this prescription works the best. But it's even more important that I don't have nearly as many people who formed that average. I don't have as many people in what we call the non-responder or poor responder category. So just focus first on the it's a little bit hard to see, but this color gray, okay, this color gray are the people who were that Monday high, Friday low. Look how many of them just sort of had no response or even a negative response. They didn't really do much. One person did quite well. And then if you look at this group, the darkest bars, there's not a single person who went negative. They all gained something, and a lot of them gained a lot. So this was encouraging to us that Let's, let's, maybe the reason why we got the average we got is because we actually almost eliminated that poor or non-responder category. And when we look back, kind of getting into the genes in the muscles, in, in the samples, this is just a snapshot, we started to look at a couple of, these are genes that uh, express receptors for pro-inflammatory molecules on muscle. And as we kind of expected, if somebody was on that high, high, high program, 
they ramped up their expression of these two genes more than everybody else did. So it's starting to make a little sense. Maybe that's why that group didn't do quite as well. But if we, f if we flip this page and now just look at function, right, everybody got stronger. And this, by the way, what we, the reason why these slides look the way they do, we actually put everybody on a pre-training program. So these are people who weren't used to doing this stuff. So for four weeks, they all did the same thing, and it was kind of a break-in period. And just during the break-in period, they gained a fair amount of strength gained a fair amount of, uh, uh, this is leg press, knee extension, and this is another form of knee extension, but they gain a good amount of strength. Now, this is the point after four weeks of that where we randomized them to one of those four things, four doses. And from that point, you can see HL didn't do quite as well as the others, uh, at least not in this test. And only in one of the tests did our favorite program, HLH, kind of rise to above the rest. But it's at least some encouraging data. Now, there are other findings that we had functionally that told us that HLH probably is a good approach. So I think for an older adult, going high intensity twice a week with one lower intensity day that's really all about making you move quicker seems to work fairly well. Uh, we found it to be the best. If you don't have enough intensity, it doesn't seem to work all that well. And again, this one we think is a chronic inflammation situation. So what we're doing now, and we've actually sort of almost completed it, we did a study with the University of Kentucky, which is a two-site trial. And we call it the master's trial. And, and, and this is now exercise plus a medication. So the idea here was, here we've got, and I'll just quickly do, show you. Here we've got some induction of inflammation in the muscle, particularly in those people uh, who didn't do quite as well. And we thought, well, what, what can we do about that to address that in those people? Because we really want everybody to be as far to the right in their responsiveness as we can get them. So that's what this is about. So this is 100 older adults approximately. The idea here is to use a medication called metformin. Metformin is actually used to sort of sensitize your cells to insulin and make you uh, better able to manage blood sugar. But it has a side effect, at least we think it does, based on our preliminary studies, that it also is an anti-inflammatory drug <coughs> in muscle. And it does that, or at least we think it does that, by converting, or, or what we call uh, polarizing, a certain pro-inflammatory cell <clears throat> called an M1 macrophage into an anti-inflammatory cell called an M2 macrophage. And so we thought, well, if we prime the muscle by making it less susceptible to inflammation, maybe those people who are less responsive will do even better. So that's what we've been doing. I don't have results. This is actually, we just finished the last participant in this. And now, if you know anything about how clinical trials go, particularly, you know, if you can do it as rigorously as possible, then we're blinded. I don't know who was on the placebo versus the drug. That's something that we're going to unveil in the next month or two to kind of tell us what happened. But this was the rationale for doing it. So it's 100 folks. Now, the last thing I just wanted to mention uh, you know, wrap up is we talked a lot about this at lunch and with some of you individually but just for the group just so you're aware there's a couple of things you should know that are available to you as researchers that I would encourage you to consider uh, looking into one is we we have the privilege of coordinating coordinating a, an NIH network of six resource centers these centers are all focused on some aspect of medical rehabilitation, okay? We are what we call REACT. You can see us there in Alabama, right? This one is right here on your campus. Uh, Dr. Ken Ottenbacher is the director of what, we, what is called the Center for Large Data uh, Research, and this is CLDR. This is us. This one is at the Medical University of South Carolina, 
and their focus is really on stroke rehabilitation primarily, but any form of neurologic uh, disease rehabilitation. The one at Pittsburgh is focused on stem cell biology and the interactions between stem cells and exercise rehabilitation. They're very much a regenerative uh, rehab center. This one at Stanford is very much focused on helping practitioners understand when movement, when bodily movements are not uh, optimal. So this, they, they do what's called biomechanics, and what that means is they study in detail. Let's say a person just underwent total knee replacement, and they want to normalize their walking pattern. They have really, really high fidelity ways of assessing and modeling and doing things to get people moving as they should again. And then this last one is technology transfer. This is TREAT. It's at Dartmouth, and, and they're really focused on taking developments that are going to help people, whether they be new devices or other forms of uh, 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 treatment that need to move out of the academic medical center and into the real world. That's what they do really well. So those are the six centers, and just to highlight, ours is called REACT. We like to react to people's needs, the Rehabilitation Research Resource to Enhance Clinical Trials, and really what the center is all about is trying to raise the impact of all of our efforts to do clinical trials well. So if you're, uh, whether you're a junior investigator or a senior investigator, if you want to do a trial, and you need help in any of these areas to develop your trial, including pilot grants. We do have those. And we also, because we know eventually we want to move our supervised efforts into the home and into the community, and some people are doing that well, we have a, what we call a mobile technology lab because the days of doing a home-based treatment and filling out questionnaires are over. We now need to actually study these people in a more quantitative or more rigorous way, and using various types of technology enables us to do that. So we're helping people integrate technologies into their research as well. So I just wanted to share that. Uh, Elena already mentioned NextNet. Those are the sites in that national network, and I'll just stop with that. That's my favorite. Thanks for a great talk. Uh, it's great to see you again, uh, as always. Uh, that study that you did, the uh, variable training, the HHAJ, I missed, what was the age group that you were looking at? That was, they were all, uh, good question actually, 60 to 75. Mean was 65. So um, we, we wanted it to be focused on the older population but but identical to the previous study, which was 60 to 75 window. So is there any uh, is there any data out there? I would guess there might be, but have, has, has anybody applied that sort of approach to age groups younger to see how that changes with decades? Not yet. Not yet. I think, you know, I'm 51, and I can just... You know, so it hasn't been done in a formal way, but I can just tell you that even though we did it at 60 to 75, there's a need to do it probably in the 40 to 50 range and, you know, see if we need to titrate this over time as we get older. Uh, older adults who do resistance training with us are very robust. They're very, you know, they work extremely hard. Their maximal effort is no different than mine or yours or anybody else's. But we just think that, you know, the frequency is the issue. And if you dial that in just right, not too infrequent, not too frequent, we think we can kind of hit it, you know, hit it out of the park in terms of gaining muscle back. So that's what, but, but we don't know about the Middle Ages. We just don't know. So I was thinking about it from a maintaining yes. muscle mass point of view. In other right. words, some of those things may change. The target may change a little bit with each decade. Yep. What you want to emphasize. I agree. Right? You're probably alluding to what you feel in the gym. I have the same issues. I can tell difference in this decade. 
Yeah. Prior. Well, your recovery is different, right? Working and what's not working. Yep. So, uh, you know, we didn't do it, and it needs to be done to look in the middle. Uh, we just don't know. But I would guess that you would see over time this sort of intensity profile, I think, has to be held at some standard that we know muscle responds to. But the frequency profile probably needs to change. And athletes do this all the time. You know, tapering in athletes, they didn't have to have academic researchers like us figure it out for them. They already know it works, right? So if they're leading up to a big competition, they're tapering their training back so they can compete at the highest competitive level and you know and then they have cycles throughout the year this is my high frequency training this is my lower frequency this is my higher intensity and so so it's kind of interesting sometimes scientists are behind right well we're not what, what we want to do is understand it so that we can actually maybe leverage what we find whether it's in the stem cell pool or whatever else to to make it better for as many people as we can you know yes sir as i'm wondering if you could um if it, the, your GP can prescribe a resistance training uh, platform and also show where that's available and are there trainers and uh, are they covered by insurance? So it's a great question. There, so the answer is they certainly could uh, if they have the knowledge base to do it. Um, the ACSM, I mentioned at the beginning, this whole movement called exercise is medicine you know they've gone as far as they've got a lot of education ed, educational materials for practitioners they've got prescription pads they've got everything uh, but the reality is getting that embedded into that 90 second visit right <laughs> is it is, is, is so what i would say is you need to be uh taught what to do and how to do it by experienced people, which may mean that you need to be referred somewhere. Um, we don't honestly in our field have the referral network that we should have because this stuff is not insurable. It's only insurable if it's in the form of physical therapy, and that would be only in cases where it was associated with a hospitalization or a surgery or whatever might be the reason why the physician would recommend physical therapy, you're, you're not going to get a physical therapy uh, uh, you know, prescription because you're older. I mean, and maybe that needs to change, but um, we would certainly love to see it embedded. And, and it's, at some places they're trying. You know, medical practices can actually formalize, they can actually, you know, we've done it at UAB, the entire Department of Medicine signed a letter saying that they were adopting exercise as medicine. Now, are they actually doing it in the real world? I don't know, but I have the letter. <laughs> and other medical centers have done the same. Yes, sir. I don't know how many people know it, but Blue Cross Blue Shield uh, subsidizes your being able to use the exercise facilities like any kind of fitness. Mm -hmm. and, uh, some, some do. do. Some do. In fact, there are, there are formal programs that are insurable on some yeah. level, like silver sneakers and things of that sort. But for the individual who's, who doesn't necessarily have that option, you know, my best advice is to, is to make sure you're being taught by somebody who's certified and educated well and has the experience. And that doesn't mean everybody who's on the payroll at the YMCA or everybody on the payroll at Gold's Gym. So it's, it's a failure, frankly, on our part to not have a direct path to the right people. Um, there, are peop there are good certification programs, but you as a user wouldn't know what they are, so you wouldn't know if you, you know, if you're going to hire a lawyer or you're going to pick a new physician, you're going to do some background, right? You're going to want to know how well this person is trained and so forth. It should be the same in our profession. You should say, are you ACSM certified? If you're not, if you got your personal training certificate online last night for 25 bucks, I don't want to talk to you. <laughs> right? Yes, sir. Just a question. The first one is about the dose of metformin. And the second question is about your comments regarding the use of complementary and alternative and supplements. 
of what it will be, you know, because three or four years ago, the new line journal had all these articles about. So, emergency will be secondly to the use of what it will be something. Mm -hmm. I just want to add this about why they use them. Yes. yes. So, the first on the metformin, we were high dose, 1,700. So, 850 twice a day. Um, we found it was tolerable by almost everyone. I was blinded, but when a person, so we had a two week ramp to get there. And if a person was having GI upset or they were having issues, then the study physician might uh, keep them at half dose, 850. And that's something that on the back end we have to manage in the data who was on 850 versus 1700. But most were, most were okay with it. The, the other point, you're exactly right. The, the, the commercial industry is rampant with supplements, some of which might be useful. Most are probably not. Most are actually paying for expensive urine, I think. Uh, but what happens is if Blake Rasmussen or, or, or any of the scientists in the room discovers a new molecule or new pathway that was stimulated by exercise, then the supplement industry turns that into a product, whether it's real or not. You know, one example is really a high-profile molecule discovered about, well, it's been over a decade now, but it's called myostatin. And as soon as people identified this thing as the anti-growth factor in muscle, you could go into any nutrition store and find cans on the shelf or bottles that said the myostatin blocker, right? So you have to be careful. I do think you have a really, you know, you have a group of scientists here who have done a ton of research to help guide things that are really meaningful, like how much protein you should take, right? And whether that protein needs to be a certain balance coming from, you know, whether it's milk-based protein or other forms of protein. So I think for the older adult, uh, dietary, you know, uh, not control, but dietary guidelines that really focus on protein intake, calorie intake, probably means as much as anything. Yep. I was a little dismayed by your uh, comments about chronic inflammation um, from exercise. How would the average Joe, senior Joe, working out, yep. know when you're harming yourself more than you're helping? Yeah, and it's a good question. Um, we let me just start by saying we don't. I don't personally see, and we've tested, you know, probably somewhere between five hundred and a thousand people. I don't see the chronic inflammation of aging that we always hear about. There are guidelines for how much of a given level of a pro-inflammatory molecule needs to be in the blood for some period of time to consider it chronically elevated. We don't see it, but when we take tissue samples is when we see it, at the tissue level. So you wouldn't really know other than, um, you know, we might eventually come up with some biomarker that could tell us that. I'm just telling you today, without these persons knowing that they were chronically inflamed, and frankly, I can't even tell you they were because I don't have samples every day. I'm just sort of giving you a, a snapshot beginning and end, the book ends. Um, they, they don't really know that they're chronically inflamed. Um, if the research leads us down a path to say this program is probably better than the others, and these are coming some of the biological reasons, you know, we would just like to see that translated f to people so they would use it. Um, even the high-level athlete doesn't exercise the same muscle group three days a week they've already learned that you need larger breaks in between. But what we've done in the average person who hasn't had the experience in the, in the fitness center, we tend to bring them into studies and go three days a week, that's just sort of what we do. Uh, and I think we're learning that that's not the best approach. One last question. question. Oh, yeah. Dr. Metformin Yeah. So you said you, you came to that study because you were trying to understand the non-responders. So these were people that were actually non-responders from your previous trial? Or? Well, they weren't the same people, mm -hmm. but we were learning from the previous study that those people who didn't respond well at the level of the muscle had a greater state of what I call muscle inflammation susceptibility. 
So I didn't show you all the data, but for a variety of reasons, we characterized that muscle as inflamed. So what were the baseline characteristics of the metformin study? Same. So these people, uh, they don't have any chronic conditions, nothing uncontrolled. They may have hypertension, but it's controlled. They do not have diabetes. They do not have musculoskeletal problems that would prevent this, no neurologic disease. My, the geriatrician colleagues that I have, they, they, they sort of think that I'm recruiting the superhumans, which I'm not, but we have to put some parameters on it, right? So they're aging fairly successfully. They're within a BMI range, they're non-obese, non so their BMI is less than 30 to start with. All those things are taken into account so we can try to have a group that is relatively homogeneous. But the key is they're not weight trained. People who uh, disclose that they do this on a regular basis. So we had a five year restriction. You could not be regularly weight training for the previous five years to be eligible. All right, so, so I would like to thank Dr. Baman for the wonderful uh, talk. UTMB Health, working together to work wonders.